Uh, don't put your hand. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, so I'm very pleased to um, have the opportunity to introduce today my colleague, Dr. Roger Firestein. Um, and uh, again, as he mentioned, uh, he would love to see your faces. It makes it uh, much more conversational, and we will have a time for Q&A at the end. Um, so if you would turn on your cameras, we would love to uh, see your faces. Uh, Dr. Roger Firestein has taught more people to lead the creative problem solving process than anyone else in the world. Um, so we are excited to hear from him today. Uh, he's called the gold standard of creativity training by his clients. Um, and he has presented programs in creativity to over 600 organizations, nationally and internationally, ranging from major Fortune 500 corporations, government agencies, universities, associations, and churches. Uh, he is an associate professor and senior faculty at the Center for Applied Imagination at Buffalo State uh, Now University. We just became a university uh, from being uh, formerly a college um, and president of innovation resources. He guest lectures at the University of Buffalo School of Medicine as well. And I believe is doing some research there also. Mm -hmm. Um, Roger is the author of six books, including Leading on the Creative Edge, and Why Didn't I Think of That? His latest book, Create in a Flash, A Leader's Recipe for Breakthrough Innovation, is available worldwide. Uh, his expert views on creativity have been reported in Fast Company, Forbes, Investors Business Daily, Inc., and uh, the New York Times. You can find his new nine part video series, which I um, can personally say is really fantastic uh, on innovation on the Open Sesame online learning platform. And he is in uh, the process of writing a seventh book, Solve the Real Problem, uh, which is scheduled for the release in early 2023. Um, so I've known Roger for a while now, and he's one of those people that I look at and think, uh, how does he get all of that done and he is always doing something new and his new focus uh, is on uh, the front end of the creative problem solving process and identifying problems uh, and what is the real problem which is the focus of his session today so again i'm i'm thrilled to introduce um dr roger firestein he will um I will in a second pass it over to him um, to give his talk and then we'll have a brief Q&A at the end. So if you have questions, please feel free to post them in the chat um, and hopefully we'll have time at the end to loop back to some of those questions. Molly, um, let's, let's just make a change. Let's not pin me, okay? Just leave me where I am, okay? Sure. Yeah. All right, well, with that, um, I will pass it over to you, Roger. Great. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Wave. Everybody wave. Okay, good. Now we know you're there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good. And once again, um, if you're comfortable turning your camera on, I would appreciate that. Love to see your smiling face. And so here we go. Can everybody see my screen called Solve the Real Problem? Thumbs up on that. Got it. Good. All right. So here we go. So um, I'd like to start out with this quote from H.L. Mencken, which is on page 13 in the new book. And, if, and the quote is, for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear and simple and wrong. Right? <laughs> and just to let you know, my slides are up above. You guys are down here. So if I'm looking up above, I'm just take, keeping an eye on my slides. And based on my 45 years of experience in this field, working with thousands of people and hundreds of organizations, when it comes to solving problems that are ambiguous, that are complex, that are potentially dangerous, that need creative ideas, there's about a 99% of the time what we think is the problem is not the problem. It's a symptom of the problem. It's what the boss thinks is the problem. It's a knee-jerk reaction to the problem, or it's a first impression of the problem. And so why are we so bad at this? The reason we've been taught to find answers to problems, not to question the problem itself. And in most of our formal education, problems have been presented to us. Right? So we're going to test this. So would you please turn on your microphones, please? 
unmute yourselves for this little activity here. Okay. All right. Go ahead and unmute. There we go. Don't worry, this is not going to be dangerous. Okay. So here's the deal. As soon as you have the answer, I want you to shout it out. Okay. Here we go. Here's the question is, what is three plus three? Six. 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 Very good. Excellent. Good. Excellent. Good. Good. How about this one? What's the capital of France? Paris. 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 Terrific. You're two for two. How about this one? What's the chemical symbol for oxygen? O2. O2. Oh, perfect. You got it. Okay, good. So you can mute back up again. You got all those answers correct. You rank at 100%. Go ahead and you can move back up. All right. So here's my here's my contention. We are still using the same strategies we used in elementary school to try and solve complex non-routine, difficult, and potentially dangerous problems, right? Because we've been taught to find answers to problems, not to question the problem itself. We're gonna come back to that, all right? Time for a story, all right? And the name of this story is called Dancing with Coyotes, all right? And I have two wonderful friends, uh, Larie Kiley and Dan Crary. And up until a couple of years ago, they lived in this wonderful place called Placerville, California. Placerville, California is a small mining town. It sits at the foot of the Sierra Nevada mountains. It's absolutely gorgeous. Now, Lurie was out of town on an assignment in Japan. Lurie does similar work to what I do. And Dan, at their house, uh, sighted a coyote near their home. Now, there are stories out there about coyotes snatching up little dogs when they went out for a walk. And they have two little dogs, Razy and Lodi, and they love these dogs. Now, Dan did not want Razy and Lodi to get eaten by a mean old coyote, all right? So what's the problem that needs to be solved here? Go to the chat and just let me know what is the problem that needs to be solved here. All right, just let me know. Why is coyote there? Okay, good, okay. How to keep them safe, okay? Pat is hungry. Okay. Why are they going? Not be able to safety walk your dog. Yeah, good. How to keep the dog safe and happy. Okay, good. Good. How to protect the animals. What are the coyotes need? Okay, good. That's great. Keep the dogs alive without trying to kill the coyotes. Okay, great. These are wonderful. Okay. Separation between the dogs and coyotes. Okay, excellent. How to keep the coyotes away. Okay, it's beautiful. Thank you very much. So you got it. So here's how Dan just defined the problem. Dan defined the problem as how to get rid of the coyotes, which some of you mentioned. Perfectly legitimate problem, okay? So now it's legal to shoot coyotes in Placerville, California because they're considered a menace. But Dan is too tender-hearted; He could never handle an animal, not even a coyote. So Dan finds a wildlife rehabilitator. Meet wildlife rehabilitator Dave, right? And Dave said, let's do this. Let's set some humane traps for the coyotes. And then once we trap them, we'll relocate them up to the Sierra Nevada mountains. We'll let them loose, be free. Coyotes, here you go. So that sounds like a pretty good idea to Dan. So Dan buys two super duper Acme Coyote traps for a total of 300 bucks a piece. It's gonna be the hero, okay? So unfortunately the two traps didn't work. All he caught was a fox and a grumpy raccoon, right? So Dan reasoned, he said, well, if two traps don't work, perhaps two more will work, all right? So now Dan buys four Acme super duper humane coyote traps for an investment of $1,200 in the Great Coyote Trapping Summit. All right, Dan checks the traps for weeks, okay? No coyotes traps, but he still sees them. The dogs are still in danger of being a quick meal if they go for a walk. So how does this end? First, a little bit about coyotes. Coyotes are pack animals. Coyotes are also nomads, they follow the food. So if there's no food source for the coyotes, they'll move on, right? So one way to look at the problem would be to state it something like our friend Dan did, when I would be like, how might we eliminate the coyotes? Another, as you folks mentioned, was might be, how might we keep our little dogs safe? Now, if you focus on the first problem, how might we eliminate the coyotes or how might we get rid of the coyotes? You come up with ideas like shooting coyotes and coyote traps, $1,200 in the coyote traps, there you go. But what if you focused on the other problem? You, how might we keep our little dogs safe? When you do that, you might come up with an idea like this. Put the doggies in a car, take them to a safe place to walk. Dan never did trap a coyote, no potential food source. The doggy gets a, gets a car ride and a walk at the same time. Okay, 
Dan is a brilliant man, okay? Um, and he saw the problem is getting rid of the coyotes. And all of Dan's energy was going into solving the coyote problem and not the real problem, which was to keep the dog safe. So if Dan Crary, Dr. Dan Crary, can fall victim to solving the wrong problem, so can the rest of us. And here's one thing that we can all do right now, immediately, to improve our problem solving ability. That thing is, don't trust your first instinct. Don't trust your first instinct. Okay. So remember when you were in school and you took those multiple choice tests, okay? And when you came to a question, you weren't quite sure what the answer is. Could be A, could be B, could be C. Could be C. What was the advice? Let's go to the chat once again. What was the advice? Uh, guess, pick C, uh-huh. Trust your gut, mm-hmm. Trust the first instinct, trust the first instinct, trust the first instinct, trust, oh yeah, you got it, you got it, absolutely, all right. And that's exactly right. That was the advice that I got. Go with your first impression. It's usually the right answer. Trust your first instinct, go with your first impression. And as in fact, in the 2000 edition of Barron's How to Prepare for the GRE, they said this, they said, exercise great caution if you decide to change an answer. Experience indicates that many students who change answers change to the wrong answer. Hmm. That is bad, bad advice, and it is absolutely not true. Not true at all, okay? Going with your first impression of what you think is correct is known as the first instinct fallacy. And it's based on the belief that you should avoid changing answers when taking tests. Your first instinct is best. But research has shown that most test takers who change their answers, change them from incorrect to correct. As a matter of fact, changes from wrong to right, outnumber changes to right to wrong by a margin of over two to one. Bottom line is, when you change your answers, you improve your score. So research on changing answers on tests dates back to as early as 1928. And in 33 studies from 1928 to 1984, not one of those studies found test takers were hurt by changing their answers. So why do we trust the first instinct anyway? The answer is, it feels better. It feels better. See, the first instinct fallacy is so accepted because it feels worse to change a correct answer to an incorrect one than to stick with an original incorrect answer. We remember changing to the right answer to the wrong answer because it hurts us. And when you've discovered you made this misstep, you start beating yourself up by saying, well, if only I had, if only I had. Here's my example, okay? I'm at the grocery store, okay? A couple of lines at the grocery store. You know where I'm going with this. You're in the line at the grocery store. Do, 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 do. you see the line over there? You go, that one's going faster. Do, do, do. Should I? That one's going. And you go over to that line, right? Get in that line. What happens? This line speeds up. So you say, if only I had stayed in that line. That's the same thing. That's what's going on here. So a simple way to sum up the first instinct fallacy is what we first think is the answer is not the answer. First instinct fallacy, what we first think is the answer is not the answer. I'd like to introduce you to a new fallacy and that's directly pertinent to what we're doing. It's called the first problem fallacy. A simple way to sum up the first problem fallacy is what we first think is the problem is not the problem. Okay. Now, Dan defined the problem as how to get rid of the coyotes, when in fact, the real problem was how to keep the little dog safe, okay? So the one thing, the one thing I want you to get from today, what you think is the problem is often not the problem. And we just, as, um, as Molly mentioned, we just completed a nine-part series on innovation with the Open Sesame uh, Open Sesame eLearn e -learning platform. I want to show you a little four-minute video that talks about uh, what you think is a problem is not the problem. And here we go. Creativity is not coming up with a great idea. The key to creativity is solving the right problem. Here's what Albert Einstein had to say about his approach to problem solving when he was asked, if some imminent disaster threatened the world and you had one hour in which you knew you could save it, how would you spend your time? Einstein replied, I would spend the first 55 minutes identifying the problem and the last five minutes solving it. For the formulation of a problem is often far more essential than its solution. 
which may be merely a matter of mathematical or experimental skill. Most people believe that creativity is coming up with a great idea. Not so. The key to creativity is solving the right problem. The fact is, it doesn't do any good to generate ideas for solving the wrong problem. We've been taught that the initial impression of the problem is the right one. We have a good reason for this. School already sets up the problem for us. 2 plus 2 equals 4. What is the capital of Poland? Warsaw. But to increase your likelihood of success, it's crucial to challenge your initial impression of what you think is the problem. Here's an example. In 1980, the conventional wisdom was that the cause of a heart attack was cholesterol buildup in an artery of the heart. The thinking was that the buildup would progress over time until it completely blocked blood flow through the artery and caused a heart attack. When a heart attack occurred, doctors believed that the only treatment was to reduce the patient's oxygen requirements by reducing their heart rate and controlling their blood pressure with medication, while also aggressively treating any complications. That was until a breakthrough study examined autopsies of a multitude of heart attack victims. The study revealed that it was not just plaque that caused the arteries to close and patients to die. In fact, less than 50% of the blockage was due to the plaque. Instead, the plaque had become unstable and ruptured or fissured. When this happened, it exposed the cholesterol core in the plaque to the blood in the artery. The body's natural response is to form a blood clot over the plaque and seal the rupture. As a result, it was the clot that caused the sudden and complete occlusion of the artery. A blood clot caused the heart attack. Game changer. Plaque in the heart was part of the problem, but for years the medical field accepted it as the core issue because they didn't stop to question their collective understanding. Doctors were focused on fixing the immediate problems with their heart attack patients, so they weren't looking further to determine what they were missing. Sound familiar? Now when a heart attack victim reaches the hospital, the primary focus is to save heart muscle by administering a clot buster medication or by stenting the artery. Stents are small tubes that form a passageway through the blood clot. As a result, dramatically more heart attack patients not only survive, but are spared life-changing complications. Your problem doesn't have to be as dire as a heart attack to benefit from deeper exploration. Identifying the real problem will always lead to more fruitful solutions. So how do you find the real problem? Ask lots of questions. But these just aren't any kinds of questions. These are creative questions. You see, the language you use to describe a problem is going to dictate the kinds of solutions you generate. For example, we don't have enough money. Good or bad question? Answer, bad question. In fact, it's a statement. When you hear that statement, your brain says, okay, we don't have any money, decision made, move on. Let's try a different approach. How might we raise the money for this project? Or how might we reduce the cost of this project? Good and creative questions. Questions framed in this way provoke your mind to search for solutions. They tell your brain, let's go find some answers. And because we're using the word might, these can be any answers. We haven't made any decisions yet. Look for options. When you're redefining the problem, you want questions that open up your thinking. So use these phrases to begin your creative questions. How might? How to? What might be all the ways to? In what ways might I? When cardiologists, heart surgeons, and researchers were investigating heart attacks, they might have asked questions like, how might we reduce the number of deaths from heart attacks? What might be all of the factors contributing to a heart attack? How might we reduce the recovery time for heart attack victims? Give it a try. Next time you need to solve a tough problem, back up a step. Don't immediately accept your initial impression of the problem as the real problem. Just as you generate creative ideas for solving a problem using brainstorming, you can also brainstorm ways to redefine a problem. Use these guidelines to generate creative questions. Defer judgment, strive for quantity, seek wild and unusual questions, combine and build in other questions. When you're facing a tough situation, try this exercise. Write down at least 15 different ways to restate your problem. Then select the question that describes the main obstacle keeping you from your goal. Only then begin generating ideas to solve your problem. 
Coming up with over 15 creative questions should take only about five to 10 minutes. It's time well spent, guaranteed. The problem we see is the problem we solve. Invest the time identifying the true problem and generate ideas only after you've clearly identified the best problem. The time you spend identifying the real problem prevents you from generating ideas that are off target and action plans that have no traction. And remember, to get ahead of the herd, get creative. All right, so I uh, hope you enjoyed that. We can talk more about this later. Uh, this, as Molly mentioned, is now on the Open Sesame e-learning platform. There are eight other videos around on this platform with, that uh, focus on the real problem, making connections, uh, how to get people to fall in love with your idea. Um, it just if you're interested in it, go to opensesame.com. Just put my name in. You can preview them for free. And I think they're like nine bucks a, a, a video. So uh, take a look at it. We had a lot of fun doing them and they just recently came out and we're very pleased to be as part of Open Sesame Plus on that. So there's a resource for you. Okay, so we're focusing on clarifying the problem. Um, we're focusing on clarifying the problem because as I mentioned, it doesn't make any sense to generate ideas for solving the wrong problem. And as many of you know, most of the people associate creativity with ideas, with brainstorming, with generating lots and lots of ideas. But as I mentioned earlier, it's been my experience that the stage of the creative process where, at, where the problem is clarified is even more important than generating ideas because it doesn't make any sense to generate ideas for solving the wrong problem. Here's a quote from Stuart Firestein's book, Ignorance, How It Drives Science, No Relation. Love this quote, love this book, okay? Here's what he says, he says about questions. He says, questions are more relevant than answers. Questions are bigger than answers. One good question can give rise to several layers of answers, can inspire decade-long searches for solutions, can generate whole new fields of inquiry, and can prompt changes in entrenched thinking. Answers, on the other hand, often end the process. Okay. And we begin creative questions with the phrase, how to, how might, in what ways might, what might be all the ways to. These are divergent, open-ended questions. Those of you that have been through the program are very familiar with these. And so sometimes I get this excuse. I don't have time to clarify the problem. I got to get stuff done. And they usually don't use the word stuff, okay? So uh, here's some research from the creative, uh, the creativity Library. And uh, as a matter of fact, our keynote speaker uh, uh, tomorrow is the senior author on this. And in a study on problem construction, researchers instructed half of the study participants to restate the problem in a variety of ways before they started to work, okay? One half. The other half of the participants were instructed to read the problem and immediately go to work. Here's what they found. The folks that restated the problem in a variety of different ways produced more original and higher quality solutions than those who participants who went right to work and did not spend time refining the article or re re redefine the problem. So when I read this article, when I read this piece, I was, I was fascinated with it. And so I was looking through it and looking through it and there was something I wanted to know. It's like, how long did they take to redefine the problem? And I couldn't find it in the study. And so I called Mark Runko, who was another author of the study, I said, Mark, how much time did they spend redefining the problem? Here's what he said. The researchers didn't place a limit on the amount of time the group was allowed to generate problem restatements. In fact, the researchers instructed the participants to take your time, there are no time limits. However, when they observed them, the subjects took about five to six minutes to finish generating a list of problem statements from which they selected a problem and generated ideas to solve them. So even with no formal or structured training like many of you have, just the instructions to take your time and generate a variety of ways to restate the problem, the subjects created better solutions when they took five to six minutes to generate alternate definitions of the problem. So here's the question. Can you afford to spend five minutes to find the real problem? Can you afford not to? Okay. So there's some research from the library. I like to go and uh, get research from my philosopher friend, Phil Kepler. And we interviewed Phil for a number of the videos on here. Phil actually took uh, my introductory class. And so here's what Phil has to say about redefining the problem. The creativity helps you not look at 
look at things as a problem. It's trying to find the solution, and that's the exciting thing about it. Things aren't problems anymore. It's just just difficult difficult situations, and you're trying to find the solution. Now, uh, I sit there and say, how does this work? Let's 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 sit and th and I go just just take a minute, shut the brain down just for a second, and and uh, reboot it, and think. Let's creatively solve this without losing your temper, without frustration, as the sweat is dripping down your forehead, sweat is getting into your eyes, your eyes are stinging. You have to think and, and get calm and think creatively. How can we make this work? And it's interesting how the calm comes over you and that whole negative feelings leave you and you get to focus on the job and things just start to happen. The creativity. In the words of a farmer. <laughs> So as I was writing Solve the Real Problem um, and pondering this topic, this idea occurred to me. Now, generating many different definitions of the problem using creative questions is an incredibly simple concept, but people find it revolutionary. And even folks in medicine that we've been doing some work with, because it hasn't occurred to them to generate many different definitions of the problem. And folks are familiar with brainstorming and gerrymandering ideas, but generating many different problem definitions to clarify the problem to solve is something most of us have never experienced because we've been taught to find answers to problems, not to question the problem itself. Okay, and that's the almost singular focus of the new book, Solve the Real Problem. Um, and because if it's not simple, people are not gonna do it. And so that's the singular focus of the book, uh, focus creative questions, and solving the right problem. So here's how we wrote the book. Um, I interviewed people from Solve the Real Problem from medicine, engineering, government, education, negotiation, agriculture, aviation, business, the military, everyday life. And I asked them one question. And the question I asked them is, can you tell me a story from your life or from your work when you discovered the problem that you were trying to solve was not the problem at all? And I've got some wonderful stories in the book. And so when I analyzed the stories, they settled into four approaches or four mindsets. And as you know, a mindset is a particular way of thinking and a mindset is habitual, it's our go-to approach. And it's our default way of solving a problem. So the book is designed to illuminate the mindset you're currently working on, to introduce other mindsets that might be helpful, to offer some strategies for consciously changing the way you can think about problems. And so you can consciously change the mindset that best suits your current challenge. So what are the mindsets? Here they are. Challenge your assumptions, get an outside perspective, see the big picture, and look for all of the details. Challenge your assumptions, get an outside perspective, see the big picture, and look for all the details. Um, so this is a story that really hits on all four mindsets. I love this story, okay? And this is about how about a young engineer at Boeing used two pieces of scrap metal and saved the airline industry billions of dollars. Our story begins with jumbo jets. As a matter of fact, the 747 it begins with. And in 1979, a young engineer who graduated from the University of Colorado begins work on the cockpit design team for the Boeing 747. When I interviewed Scott, he said, he said, I walked into the building that first day and he said, it was unbelievable. The building is the size of 10 football fields and there were six of them. The buildings at Boeing are so big that clouds form the top of it. And so here's, he said, I saw 747s being built line after line after line of them, and here they are being built. And so the Boeing 747 was known for this distinctive hump. You always see a 747 that's got the hump up there in the front, okay? Now, because of this hump, on the fourth day of work, Scott was given the windshield microbiome mechanism for the 747. His job, his problem to solve was get this mechanism FAA certified. Fourth day of work, kid, get it certified. Okay, great. So because of the hump design, when the plane would start to take off, the angle of attack of the airstream would change the wipers and it would lift the wipers off the windshield. Now, according to Scott, this is engineer talk, he goes, the pilot lost visibility on takeoff and landing. In our terms is the pilot couldn't see the runway on takeoff and landing in rain and snow. Not a good thing if you're a pilot of a 747, okay? So this device took the air's angle of attack and measured it, it calculated the airspeed, it used a motor to tighten the spring that would hold the wind wiper to the windshield. Okay, get it certified, Scott, get it certified. So the mechanism was complicated with lots of moving parts, it could easily break down. 
To replace the mechanism, the airplane had to be taken out of service for 10 days. They had to take the whole front cowling off the airplane. The total cost to replace the mechanism at one time was approximately $100,000. To replace the windshield wiper mechanism was $100,000. Okay, so I'm going to read this to you because I just love this story. And these are Scott's words. Later that day, Scott and his tour, he's getting his tour of the plant, fourth day, they, they walk by a bin with a little pieces of aluminum. And Scott asks this guy, he says, I see this bin of aluminum. He said, they're about six inches long and they've got a curve to them and they've got three holes in them and they're kind of countersunk into the aluminum. And so I asked my guy, what are these things? And he said, well, we had a design for a railing that was a little too long, so we had to clip these pieces off. And Scott goes, can I take a few? Of them? And this guy said, sure, they're just scrap. We're just gonna scrap it. And so Scott says this, he said, I had an idea. If I tax these curved pieces of metal onto the windshield wipers, the air would flow over them. They looked like little scoops to me. The curved shape would create a downward force like a sail on a boat. But instead of pushing a boat forward, the sail would push the wiper down on the windshield. And so as the airplane accelerated, the air flowing across the metal pieces would increase, and as a result, increase the pressure on the wipers. He was making an airfoil, okay? So he says this, I riveted a couple of these metal pieces onto the windshield wiper blade and we tried it in the wind tunnel. First time it didn't work. The wipers would still come up as the airplane accelerated, but then I adjusted them a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. And pretty soon the wipers would not lift off the windshield no matter what we tried. We tried rain and we tried snow and we tried ice and they would stay right down on the windshield the whole time. Now on all the airplanes, all you're doing is taking a windshield wiper off and putting a windshield wiper on just like on a car. And by the way, that was Scott Kempshaw's first design award. So what does it look like? Okay, so here they are. Here's Scott's contribution to the 747. Okay, there's one view of them. And here they are right there. They kind of look like little clothespins to me, but they're bigger than that, okay? And now they're on just about all aircraft, okay? So let's take a look at the long-term results of Scott's invention, okay? Now, the, this original design cost $10,000 each for a total of $20,000 per aircraft. The cost was immediately eliminated. They weighed 20 pounds each, added even 40 pounds to the aircraft. The weight was immediately eliminated, okay? So the lifespan of the 747 is about 30 years. Because the mechanism is complicated with many moving parts, it'd have to be replaced every 10 years. That's $100,000 times three equals $300,000 per airplane to replace the windshield wiper, okay? Now, 1,567 Boeing 747s were delivered. So that's $300,000 times $1,567. In 1980, dollars that's $4,971,000,000. Million million. And you still have to replace the waiver rates, okay? In 2023, dollars that's $11,075,885,000, million million $185,000, to be exact. Okay? So with Scott's invention, the aircraft doesn't have to be taken out of service. The wiper blades can be changed while the 747 is on the tarmac, and it takes about two hours for a cost of about $2,000. Love this story. So let's see. Challenge your assumptions. Get an outside perspective. See the big picture. Look for all the details. Let's break it down and see what Scott did. Challenge your assumptions. Now, Boeing assumed that the solution was a wiper mechanism, okay? Scott's job was to get the exist existing new wiper me mechanism certified by the FAA. That's it. So if he not had challenged the assumption that there might be a better way to keep the wipers on the windshield, he would not even have perceived the scrap metal. Outside perspective, Scott was a fresh pair of eyes. This is his fourth day on the job. He brought a fresh look to the problem. See the big picture. Scott looked beyond his immediate task of getting the wiper mechanism certified. The, me the problem was keeping the windshield wipers on the, on the windshield, but Scott didn't stop there. He looked at maintenance costs and the time spent replacing a complicated system. Look for all the details. He noticed how complicated that other mechanism was. And he also noticed the scrap pin bin. So considering the details of the scrap pieces, he saw them as a way to solve the wiper problem. Okay, so here it is. Here's the gist of it. To identify the best problem to solve, pause. Don't accept your initial impression of the problem as the real problem. First instinct fallacy, first problem fallacy. Ask creative questions, generate about 10 of them. Okay? Choose the creative question that best defines your problem generate ideas to solve it. Okay. Last thought, and then we'll have some time for questions. We started with coyotes. We're going to end with bees. Bees, right? Now, Scott's wiper blade innovation cost the company almost nothing, but it saved the airline industry billions of dollars. Right? 
Scott asked a few creative questions. He had the tenacity to try out his idea, and he had a company at that time that was willing to let him experiment. The fact is, if you're the leader in your organization, you have absolutely no ability to make someone come up with creative ideas. You can't do it. Because if you want to make, if you want bees to make honey, you can set up a bee box in the spring, which is the perfect time of year. You can buy the best bee boxes available. You can arrange the bee box in the most beautiful, perfect place on your property. You can bring in a healthy queen, but you can't make the bees make honey. You see, reading a book on creativity or attending a creativity workshop doesn't inoculate you to be more creative, right? So try and also trying to impose creativity from an external organizational mandate on people has been one of the major reasons why organizational innovation initiatives fail. You see, you can't force innovation, but you can free it. Now, Scott did not submit his idea to a company-wide idea collection system. He didn't take weeks to ponder the problem. He didn't get his idea approved by the senior vice president of innovation or the chief innovation officer. And he didn't come up with his idea in the company's brand new innovation center. All Scott did was ask a couple of creative questions. But there was something else going on when Scott made his discovery. The air was right. Uh, Lewis Thomas, uh, in his wonderful book, The Lives of a Cell, which I highly recommend, beautiful, beautiful biologist, he says this about discovery. He says, discovery cannot be prearranged in any precise way. The minds cannot be lined up in tidy rows and given directions from printed sheets. You cannot get it done by instructing each mind to make this or that piece for central committees to fit with the pieces made by the other constructed minds. It does not work this way. What it needs is for the air to be made right. If you want a bee to make honey, you do not issue protocols on solar navigation or carbohydrate chemistry. You put them together with other bees and you better do it quickly because solitary bees don't stay alive. And you do what you can to arrange the general environment around the hive. If the air is right, the science will come in its own season just like pure honey. So if you want to make your people, if you want your people that you lead in your workshops, in your seminars, in your classes, in your businesses, to be more creative, if you want pe your people to look for problems to solve, make the air right. Thank you. All right, let's um, open it up. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, turn on your microphones, please. And let's have some questions. Molly, I know you have stuff in, this, in the Zoom chat. I uh, just want to let you know that here it is. This is the beta copy of Solve the Real Problem. Yes, it's now out for the beta readers. Um, if you want to pre-order the book, just go to my website, rogerbeierstein.com. Click on Books and Resources right over here. There's a little drop-down menu uh, that you can select your hard copy or your digital copy. If you order a hard copy from me, I'll sign it. Um, and we expect release on this now in probably about May. So we're really, really excited. About it. What's it inside? It's got pictures. It's got airplanes. It's got coyotes. Yeah. So, okay. So, uh, Molly, what do we got in the chat? Uh, yeah. So, uh, first, I'll just say really wonderful talk, Roger. And I'm, I'm so excited that this is your, your focus because oftentimes we just skip over that whole first step of the process and people Ooh. were really reacting to that in terms of how we... Um, I uh, uh, don't think about uh, the assumptions we're making. Um, and also the quote, one quote that you said that really stuck out is that we've been taught to um, solve the problem, but not to question the problem itself. Yeah. Um, so there was a question um, from uh, Melissa and, and it seems like the, the four mindsets were really resonating with her. So she mm. was uh, wondering if you could revisit those four mindsets. Well, sure. Yeah, sure, that. sure can. And, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go to, to the book here. <laughs> so they are challengers, and we talk about it in the book. Okay, challenge your assumptions, get an outside perspective, see the big picture, and look for all of the details. Now, seeing the big picture and looking for all the details, they're visual. Okay, and they're also the opposite. Okay. So this is where it goes to, you really need to be flexible about your mindset. 
And we have wonderful examples in there. We have some manufacturing examples about, you know, uh, see, getting out of their perspective, seeing the big picture. So challenge your assumptions, get an outside perspective, because we all know the best source for new ideas is for folks outside of the organization. See the big picture and look for all the details. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and Rosemary had a question. Um, uh, regarding uh, the last point that you made in your talk about making the air right. And she was wondering if you could uh, more specifically define or elaborate on that. I think you might know the answer to that, making the air right. Because you know those companies, you know those situations where the air is right. And if we break it down, you know, it's, it's sort of like people are accepting their ideas. But one of the best ways that I know how to make the air right is to ask creative questions. And what those things do is when we interviewed folks about this. We said, you know, about creative questions. People are saying it changes the energy. It changes the energy in the meeting. And let me just uh, read this one quote here um, from Dr. Priya Pinto. And Dr. Pinto was in one of our um, sessions. She's the president of, of All Well Incorporated, which is a healthcare organization. And so she says this. She says, I continually say, what might be all the ways? I say that constantly. It's kind of become a discipline among us to now look at things in a much more expanded way. I feel the caliber and the quality of our conversations have changed since then. So I think the entry point to making the air right is when that first problem comes up, how might we, how to? And that whole, that whole language, because this is the language, creativity is the language of possibilities. When we're talking about creative questions, that spurs you to create possibilities. So that's what I would say about making the air right. But I think we can all kind of kind of get that feeling of, you know, when you were in those organizations, when the air was right and the air wasn't right. So but try creative questions first. Great. Um, and I think we have time for, for one yeah, more question. Um, so this wasn't specifically a question, but it was yeah. a, a comment by Rustin. And he said um, that he has his students uh, generate, you know, not just 15, but 150 ideas. And that was in response to you um, speaking about how we should generate many questions. And, and so I too have seen um, with students when I um, try to get them to generate many idea or many questions, actually not just many ideas to diverge on questions that sometimes they struggle with that. So any any tips or, or thoughts about how to get students not to just to diverge on ideas, but even to diverge on questions as well? Yeah, I love that quote, because as a matter of fact, we have a, a story from Bonnie Craman, uh, who used to run the Torrance Center, and she talks about, she was talking about this at the Southern Oregon University Conference and about the value of generating creative questions. And um, so, so a couple of things around that. The reason why I said 10 to 15 creative questions in Solve the Real Problem is I didn't want to freak people out, okay? Because we all know it's not difficult at all to generate 40 or 50 or 60 or 100 creative questions when you're trained in a very short period of time. But that flips people out. They're like, oh my God, I can't go with other great questions. Um, so, but the th thing is, is that when you're using creative questions, it's the same thing when you're generating creative ideas. Forced connections works great for that. That's my go-to for coming up with new ideas. Same thing for creative questions. And if you look at the guidelines that we talk about in there, as far as generating creative questions, just defer judgment, strive for quantity, seek wild and unusual questions, seek wild quite and build another questions. It's the same thing for generating ideas, but we've got questions in there instead. So yeah, wow. so I hope that helps. That's, that's a yeah. great concrete, uh, uh, answer. Thanks, Roger. And to that end, uh, Nicole said, uh, I always admire the way Roger is making things clear, how he's simplifying complex notions. And uh, so there you go. I think that answer attests to that. Um, so thank you so much for your talk, Roger. Um, very enlightening and, and a very meaningful uh, topic as well. And also if this topic is, is resonating with everyone, as um, uh, Dr. Roger Firestein mentioned, our keynote Note tomorrow. Her name is uh, Dr. Ronnie Ryder Palman, and she is really one of the foremost um, experts uh, and researchers on problem finding and creativity. Um, mm -hmm. So if you find this topic interesting, um, please join us tomorrow for that keynote um, and also the other sessions as well. Um, and speaking of other sessions, the next session uh, starts in about 15 minutes. Uh, and I posted the link um, to those, uh, that document with the Zoom links in the chat, um, if you've lost track of that. Um, so thank you all for being Molly. here. Molly. 
Can yes. you can you repost that link, please? Because I yes, can. I, I will post I it. Again. Find the links, a list of the links for all the other sessions. Can you please do that for us? Yes. So I will post that in the chat again, so that you all have access to that. Um, thank you again for being here, and we will see you in the next session. Thanks, everyone. Roger, Thanks, Roger. If you have yeah. time, check in the chat. I put a link of the uh, TED. Uh, uh, speech from yep. a young guy in Africa, and this is exactly the uh, the story along the same line as your coyote, coyote and dogs. You will love it. <laughs> Thank you very much. I see you. Have fun. Thanks. Thank and you finally, much. a huge round of applause for Roger. Thank uh, thanks, guys. So much, so much fun. Thanks. Really Bye. appreciate you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Always keep your book next to me. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Sam. <laughs>